Welcome to this meeting of the Mind Technology and Society Seminar Series, the longest running seminar series here at UC Merced, brought to you by the Cognitive Information Sciences Group and kindly sponsored by the School of Social Sciences, Humanities, and Arts, as well as the Robert Glushko and Pamela Samuelson Foundation. Uh, today, we have uh, a wonderful visiting speaker coming to us from a sister campus. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Suzanne Yaki, uh, she uh, got her PhD, PhDs in cognitive psychology and neuroscience from the University of Bern, and then went on to do her habilita habilitation there. If you don't know what that is, go look it up, it's right. worth knowing. Um, uh, she did some postdoctoral work in Ann Arbor, and then was on the faculty at the University of Maryland College Park for a while before taking her current position at the University of California, Irvine, where she's in the School of Education in the Department of Cognitive Sciences, and also a fellow at the UCI Center for the Neurobiology of Learning and Memory. She studies higher level cognitive function throughout the lifespan, and is very interested in interventions that might affect that function. And indeed, that looks like her topic for today. She'll be telling us about cognitive training and transfer, the importance of individual differences, Please join me in welcoming Dr. Suzanne Yankee. Thanks so much for that kind introduction and for having me here. So I'm really having a great time learning about all your work and, and uh, learning what you're all doing. And also the campus is in such a beautiful location. I was telling uh, David, I think. So I grew up in a very small town surrounded by cows. So having all the cows here, yeah, that feels like home to me. So I, I really love it, so that's great. Um, so as David was saying, so I've been studying um, higher cognitive functions, so working memory, executive control for the past um, uh, yeah, 15 or uh, 20 years. And I'm really interested in understanding individual differences. So I'm, I'm trying to understand how people learn and how it is and why it is that people learn differently. And then within that broader context, I'm trying to see whether I can find ways how um, I can improve people's learning and, and trying to get uh, people better at things. So that's the very broad uh, context. And I really work across the entire lifespan, starting from not to offend any infant researchers here, but by, my youngest kids I work with are four-year-olds, and then the oldest olds I work with are in their 90s, so I, I, I have a very broad um, range of populations. But for today's talk, I focus mostly on young adults and older adults. If we have some time in the end, or someone really want to know a little bit more about what we're doing with the kids, I have some add-ons too at the end that we could, um, that I can show, but, but um, the broader topic is really young adults and older adults right now. Um, and also, feel free to really interrupt and ask questions at any time. I, I like the interactive aspects of talks, so feel free to at any time, and I can dynamically, dynamically adjust um, my talk to whatever you want to know as well. All right. <clears throat> so um, when I came to the US about 10 years ago, so I'm from Switzerland originally, I learned pretty quickly that Americans like um, two things, mostly. So first of all, they like to be very, um, look like this, so abs, I mean, like Wolverine, that's one thing that they're really interested in getting. And the other thing that they really like um, also is being very smart, or appearing very smart, or at least being smarter than the other person. Um, so the question is also, um, how can we get those things? Can we get apps like Wolverine um, and look like this? Um, and also, can we become as smart as uh, Einstein or others, and how should we go about that? Of course, when it comes to physical exercise, pretty easy. Go and buy a gym membership and off you go, and after a few, let's say, weeks or months, you might look like this. But um, are we really able to also improve our mental capacity, and if so, how should we go about that, and is that even possible? So you can now Google, and of course you know all of this as well, so if you ask Google directly, there the brain training industry has a lot of answers to this. So you should just buy one of these programs, sign up for a couple of weeks, and there you go, you can increase your IQ by 45% points. I'm not making this up, so these are some of these advertisements that people make and say, oh, train this for four weeks and your IQ uh, will go up by 45% or something. Well. 
And what does the science say about that? And by the way, I'm not sponsored by any of these companies here, so I don't have stock options or anything. I really believe in science as being a public good, so none of my programs that I'm developing is for sale. You can download them from a website and use them for research as much as you want. But they're out there, so it's a, right now it's a multi-billion dollar industry out there, so people try to set, sell their products and, and promise anything from the 45% increase in IQ to also that playing these games might prevent anything from yeah, dementia to anything you want, pretty much. Well, the sad truth is that um, usually, or I would say probably about 99% of these big brain, brain training products probably don't do whatever they advertise for. So what they do is they make you better at these games. So you're playing these games, you get better at these games. And that's already, depending on what your health status is, it could be a good thing. But it's not all that interesting. Of course, if you're training something, you're getting better at it. But the real question is, do these, does playing these games translate or generalize or transfer, as we call it, to other domains which are different from what you're specifically trained on? And this is really the topic that I'm interested in when I do my work. So I try to improve people's attention and working memory skills, and I'm interested to see whether there are some generalizing uh, effects to other domains. So let me give you an analogy to, to um, get to this point a little bit better. So if you're going running, so for a month, two months, three months, let's say, you go running every day, what you will do, you are improving probably your leg muscles, but also your general cardiovascular functioning um, uh, through running. So what happens through that? You're not just getting or, or becoming a better runner or a faster runner, but you might also see some benefits in other domains that might rely on a healthy cardiovascular system. So you might be better in biking or swimming or climbing stairs. So everything that sort of relies on the healthy cardiovascular functioning. And what I've been interested in is um, um, very basic cognitive processes, which are sort of functioning uh, like these cardiovascular system. Um, so I've been interested in working memory and attention. That is something that's needed for all other higher cognitive uh, tasks um, or domains as well. So what we're trying to do is we develop games. So typically nowadays uh, we develop games that work on tablets, such as these here. And then we're um, having kids or young adults or older adults play on these games. And then we're interested to see whether playing those games on these cognitive skills might then translate to other games or domains, not games, domains <laughs> that are different um, um, from these functions. And I've been really focusing on uh, working memory mostly, and of course I don't have to tell most of you what working memory is, but for those who don't, so working memory is really at this intersection, uh, intersection between our perceptual uh, system, so incoming information is processed in our working memory system, and then it allows us to store information for a brief period in time in order to do other things such as reasoning, problem solving, solving math problems, language skills, and so on and so forth. So all these higher order cognitive skills rely on the functioning of the working memory system. Um, so in that sense, the working memory system is essential for cognitive, uh, uh, complex cognition. And since I'm at the School of Education, it's also very essential for um, scholastic achievement. So working memory is one of the best predictors for scholastic achievement, even beyond IQ, especially in young kids. And on another note, it's also in, uh, working memory is impaired with many developmental um, disorders such as ADHD or autism <laughs> spectrum disorder, but also clinical disorders such as major depression, Parkinson's disease. So there are lots and lots of um, disorders that also show deficits in working memory functioning. And it's also one of these processes that show early um, signs of age related uh, cognitive decline. Um, so the idea here is really what we're trying to do is uh, trying to improve working memory skills or skills related to working memory with the idea that if we can improve these skills, we might see benefits in other skills that rely or other domains that rely on the function of the working memory system. So that's again sort of the broad idea or underlying idea of why we're doing what we're doing. And we have developed uh, several different types of tasks that tap into these uh, functions. 
So one uh, of maybe the most uh, best known tasks that we've been using, but we have done some others as well, is the so-called NBAC task. And probably most of you have seen this task before, but for those who don't, let me just explain real quick. So it's a very boring task, once of all, so that's one thing. So here, so we're showing uh, participant squares at different locations on the screen, and they have to um, process where the locations of these uh, squares are. Um, so we ask them to keep track of where these squares are and um, say yes or no whether the current location or the, the square is at the same location as the one end back in the sequence. So for a two-back task here, so we had to know um, whether or not the square that you see now is at the same location as the one two-back in the sequence. So for this square, you wouldn't say nothing because that's just the first that you see here. You didn't say uh, nothing either. But here in this example here, that would be a target that you say yes to because it's at the same location as the one two before. You get the next one, you get the next one. These would both be no's. And here would be a yes a target again. Um, what's interesting about that task is you can vary the amount of uh, cognitive load, so to speak. For example, you can make this task harder or easier. So if you start with this uh, two-back task, which is fairly easy, you now can make, make it more difficult. So now you can um, have people keep track of three um, back in the sequence. So now you have to keep track three in a row, or four in a row. And our training tasks work in a way that they always try to capture people at their um, working memory uh, ability at every moment in time. So they do this for a minute or so, then we track the performance. If they do well, so they have to score over 95% correct in this task, then we would increase the difficulty level by one. If they make too many mistakes, we make it easier again. So we always try to capture them of where they are. Another nice thing about this task is too that we can introduce um, uh, levels of interference here. So in um, this example here, so what we have here, this uh, square in the lower left, and then three back later, there's another square in the lower left. In this example here, you would have, you would have to say no to it, even though it feels vaguely big, big familiar, because you, you did see this lower left um, uh, corner um, square not too long ago, but you have to say no to it, because it's three back in the sequence and not two back in the sequence. And that introduces a lot of uh, interference um, resolution that people have to deal with as well, which I think makes this task probably um, uh, very powerful for the things that we do. All right, and you can use this task with uh, spatial locations, or you can use it with objects, you can use it with letters, numbers, all you want. It's always, the results are very, very similar across different um, studies here. All right, so basic study design in the task that we're using, so typically we have people coming to the lab, so I'm going, sometimes we do some online testing as well. So we test them on a broad array of the different tasks, whatever we're interested in here. Then we have them train for a couple of test sessions, typically about 20 sessions over the course of a month that people train on, typically about um, 10, 15 minutes a day they train on this task. Um, and then we also have a control group um, uh, also, so a control condition, and there's a whole discussion about the route control condition, and we have this discussion of course as well, but one that we really like is um, one that targets something that's very little um, working memory um, that's involved in this task, so we call it the knowledge builder, so knowledge trainer, it uh, taps into general knowledge, vocabulary skills, so we give them uh, questions uh, with the four intro, intro alternatives and you know, people pick their answer here. We have a whole battery of different questions and in uh, a wide difference. So these are GRE type, SAT type uh, questions and the students really like them typically because they think they learn something. They actually do, they get better because if they get the question uh, wrong, we give the question again in the next session again and we give them also the right answer and some explanations with it. So, um, but it's very, pretty much no working memory involvement in, in this type of task. Then we get them back again, typically um, after about a month or so, we post test them. And then often also we, we, we get them back a couple of months after training completion to see whether there are any longitudinal effects of training uh, as well. Because you might think that, well, it could be interesting to see some improvements just directly after training, but are there really any long-term effects um, uh, of training as well? Here I want to foreshadow a little bit how I think about follow-up or long-term effects also, going back to the physical exercise analogy too. So if you go training for a month and then you stop for three months completely, 
it's very hard to think about how much longitudinal effects you will see several months later. And that's sort of the same way we, we look about these uh, cognitive training effects as well. So our take is that you need to keep doing at least something to see any long-term effects too. So it's not just one time you train for a month and then you're 45% smarter than for the rest of your life. Probably not going to happen. <laughs> All right. Um, so what do we find in very general terms? So we have been interested in, in several aspects. So one has really been uh, interference resolution inhibitory control, so in a broader context of executive functioning. And I'm showing you um, a data now from uh, three different studies here in uh, typically developing kids. Oh, I do have some data with kids here. Uh, but also with kids with ADHD and young adults too. When we look at their ability um, to resolve interference, so for example, how well they do in terms of um, saying no to these three back stores in two back tasks, uh, as I was um, showing you before. And what I'm showing you here are the effect size, so the improvement from pre-test to post-test of the experimental group, minus the improvement that we see in the control group here as well. And we see pretty decent effect sizes here, so these colors are somewhat completely different from the ones I see <laughs> here, but uh, never mind. So in all three um, groups here, we see improvements in uh, your ability to resolve interference. And when we also look at the inhibitory control, so in, in terms of stop signal or stroop type tasks that we use too, um, we see also nice effect sizes here, um, even also in kids with ADHD with this, this middle uh, black bar here. And this is very critical for us because in some of our studies we're focusing on kids with ADHD because that's really the some of these um, uh, the, the core cognitive issues that kids with ADHD have. So after training on these types of tasks, we see improvements in these domains, and that's very encouraging. Um, but another domain that people were really interested in too, and um, that people uh, are excited about is. Uh, uh, and which is also the most controversial part is whether or not um, training this sort of um, end back training or cognitive training can improve IQ when you look at things like fluid uh, reasoning and fluid intelligence. And some of you have, um, might have read some of the papers that I sent over to as well. So here I'm showing you the results of a meta-analysis or two meta-analyses that we did. So this is a, uh, one of my graduate student, Jackie Au, um, who was the lead author, uh, author on that. And um, two years ago, um, uh, we collected all the, the studies that were out there at this time that used some form of NBAC training to improve um, very specifically uh, measures of fluid intelligence. And again, people are excited about or interested in fluid intelligence because it's one of these domains that people have argued or abilities that is highly predictive for scholastic and professional success. And how do you measure fluid reasoning? I hope you can see that too. Um, so typically it's done with um, uh, matrix reasoning measures where you have these uh, different patterns and one of them missing and then you have to find out of different intro alternatives which are not shown here, but you have to complete, logically complete the pattern. Um, and again, it's one uh, uh, of the very strong predictors for um, uh, professional success and, and scholastic achievement. So we have been uh, collecting all these studies that have um, been using one or more of these outcome measures uh, in the domain of fluid reasoning and people who have been training on NBAC uh, for at least a week. So we wanted them to train at least for seven sessions. Um, and uh, we were able to include 20 studies. So these are just for um, young adults here. So we had a train, uh, 30 training groups and uh, uh, 24 control groups. There are a little bit more training groups because some of the studies also used two variants of the NBAC as uh, two different uh, experimental controls here. And what I'm showing you here are the effect sizes here um, at the post-test on these measures of fluid reasoning. And there are various measures that are combined here. And um, when you then subtract the effect size of the control group, typically you see some improvements. We always get retest effects. Of course, you're doing better if you're doing this test the second time. Um, but then typically, uh, people who have been training on, on NBAC, they outperform the control group. This is about a, translates to about a quarter of a standard deviation. And you might argue, uh, well, a quarter of a standard deviation is not that much. So if you would translate, uh, if you really want to, into IQ uh, points, um, it's a, a equivalent to about uh, three to four IQ points, which again, you could argue it's not that much, it's very little, but, so mind you, these are all with young adults, which you can argue, they are already pretty good in what, uh, in this measure of fluid intelligence, is typically at their peak, 
performance if you look at uh, across lifespan development. And uh, just improving a few points there can have very potentially could have some uh, applied value. If you think back on the time when you took your SATs, for example, it could mean that you could apply to this school or that school. Um, but nonetheless, so the effect sizes are still pretty small. And we saw from uh, Paul earlier too that some of the effect sizes in, in many of them um, psychological or also studies uh, more in general are pretty small. So what you could do is, of course, you could just say, oh, these effect sizes are so small, I don't care about this, this has no practical value, I'll just throw everything out there and change my field. Or you could take another approach, and this is the approach that we're taking, I'm really trying to understand why we have such big variabilities between studies, first of all. Why is it that sometimes studies do find effects and sometimes studies don't find effects? And even within studies, in our own studies, we see subjects who improve a lot after training and then we see subjects who even get worse after training. So who are these people and, and what can they tell us about learning and what can they tell us also for us to develop um, our experiment um, and our um, and games a little bit further. So I'm going to tell you a few, um, um, or give you a glimpse of a few of our studies that tried to, to really understand what are some of these factors that might predict why people improve and why people don't improve. And one of the first things that we have been looking at is the, the uh, training quantity. So how long do you actually train? And then go back to the physical analogy example too, of course, if you would think, um, I'm just going to run three times, and then you measure your cardiovascular function, there's probably not very much that you can expect. But the longer you do train, the more um, transfer you might actually, or generalizing effects or improvements in your cardiovascular functioning, you might see. And this is the same um, effect that we're seeing after cognitive training. So what I'm showing you here is in young adults, the improvement, so in effect sizes in these um, uh, fluid reasoning measures, so same that I just uh, showed you an example of, as a function of training length. So this is a between subject design here. So we have people who train for one week, so seven sessions, uh, a group that trained for ten, two weeks, three weeks, or four weeks. And then we see the improvement in these fluid reasoning measures as a function of training time. So in other words, the more you train, the more effects or the more transfer effects see, you see in these fluid reasoning measures. And this was with uh, young adults. And then one of my collaborators in uh, Prague in the Czech Republic, Anna Stepankova, she has done um, a similar design than looking at older adults. So what we're looking at here is a, a, a slightly different set of outcome measures, but also targeting these visual spatial abilities that we are interested in. And what I'm seeing, uh, what I'm showing you here are also the effect sizes as a function of how much um, uh, people train. So the control group actually here didn't train at all, so we're just looking at retest effects. This group trained for 10 days and this group uh, trained for 20 days. So again, we see these um, dose response effects and uh, other people are seeing that as well. Um, again, maybe not very surprising if you think about it, the more you train, the more benefits you might see in these outcome measures. So what about um, training quality? So does it matter how well you train? So sometimes, probably all of you who have done um, uh, experiments with undergraduates who come for course credit, sometimes you have these very interested undergraduates who are sitting there and maybe playing with their phone while doing the task or whatever they do. Um, but so the question is, if you're not really doing the task at all, would you expect any transfer effects or learning improvements in these people either? So what I'm showing you here is um, training curves in, well, again, another sample, I forgot about that. So it's also a typically developing kids. So these are um, third to fifth graders here, uh, which trained on a, a variant of the NBAC task that I was uh, showing you here. So what I'm showing you here is the average NBAC level that they reach in each session, so from uh, 1 to 18 here. And these are just three subjects, three individuals. And you can see there's a fairly bumpy ride, they have ups and downs, but overall they all get better at uh, training. Again, not very surprising, they're uh, training on it. But we also have subjects like these. So subjects who just pretty much stay on the same level throughout the, the 20 uh, or so sessions. So again, the question is, would you expect transfer in these uh, kids here who don't really seem to be doing the task properly? And the answer is, um, well, no. So what I'm showing you here is the transfer, again, on these fluid reasoning type measures here as a function of 
um, whether they showed a small training gain, so I just did a median split here, but it also works where, with regression, so this is a, just to illustrate my point better. So when you look at the kids who don't really improve at all in the training, they also don't improve in the transfer at all, so you don't see anything because there's no improvement at all. If you look at the kids with the large training game, those actually show decent effect sizing in terms of improvements in fluid reasoning. And when, it, uh, when we compare it with active controls who train all these knowledge builder type of training that I was showing you before, um, they are somewhat in between. And when we also track the improvement in the active control and then match them um, according to training gain, we don't see this uh, positive relationship between improvement in the active control task and in the fluid reasoning task. And then when we track them back um, three months later, um, everyone seems to catch up a little bit. So these are kids, they grow older, they develop, they get better at things. But nonetheless, it looks like the kids with the large training gain, we were able to give them a little bit of the boost that they could uh, hold at least to up to three months later. Of course, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure if we would measure them again a year later, these differences would have faded again because uh, my argument is that if, they're not, um, if they don't keep doing it, they might um, eventually lose these skills too. But still, up to three months la later, we see some of these improvements maintained here. Um, so why are some of these kids, um, uh, why don't they improve? Why do they have such a hard time in improving? And uh, we also gave them questionnaire, we asked about engagement, we asked about motivation. And for some of these kids that don't improve, for them this uh, training task was a really hard task uh, to do. So they found it effortful, they found it difficult, and therefore um, they didn't really improve in that. And we, we can also uh, ask the same thing to young adults as well. And uh, we actually see a very similar story here happening as well. When you look at that engagement, so we ask after each training session, so how engaged were you in this training session? Um, uh, what I'm showing you here are um, measures from three different studies here, or, well, three different uh, groups. So on the left, the darkest um, uh, bars are the, the people who actually completed an entire study. They came in for pretest. they did 20 sessions of training at home on their own, they came back for post-test. But then we always have some people who just drop out after a couple of sessions. Um, so after a couple of sessions, they decide, oh, you know what, this is not really what I want to do. I want to do something else. They don't come back. And then the last um, group here um, is a group that we recruited that did the training for payment. So I'll come back to the payment issue too. But the first two groups actually this entire, did this entire um, training program for just out of interest of science. There are people who exist who actually do that, who are interested in, in doing that as well. But then the, the uh, people in white um, here were the ones that we paid for completing the training. And what you can see here is that the engagement level for the people who completed everything, they received no payment, it's fairly stable throughout the four weeks of training. But then the people who dropped out, they show a nice uh, consistent pattern of um, um, decreasing engagement, there's no more people here because they dropped out eventually. But the interesting part is also that the people who got um, uh, into training for payment, they also showed a steady decrease in engagement. So the question is now, how does training look like if we look at training performance in these people with the decreases of engagement? And when I plot the engagement, the self-reported engagement uh, level here, and then I look at how much they actually improve in training, we see pretty, pretty decent correlation here. The more you are engaged in training, the more you actually also improve in training. So it doesn't help if you just buy your gym membership and just sit there on the chair and wait to be better, but you actually have to sit there and be engaged and do the training in order to really see some improvements here. So this is my take home message on on that. And then the last part that we also found uh, very important here is also we, we are interested in, uh, or we were interested in this study in, in finding out whether people had some uh, beliefs in terms of how malleable they think that cognitive skills are. So we used some of Carol Dweck's uh, questionnaires uh, to assess whether or not they think that um, IQ is something that's uh, fairly fixed. Um, so in whatever this color is here, 
um, dark and blue are the people who uh, more likely say that IQ is something that's malleable. You might think of, well, if you think it's something fixed, why on earth would you even sign up for a training study? But this is an entirely different question. But uh, what we see here is that we see more improvement in these people who think that IQ is more malleable than people um, who think that IQ is fixed. And uh, in a similar um, vein as well, when you look at the outcome measures, again, it matrix reasoning, then the people who think that IQ or cognitive ability is something that's malleable, those are the ones that show more transfer effects. So in other words, uh, participants with a more incremental belief, they don't only just show more improvement during training, but they also are more likely to, to show a transfer effects. So these are some of the things that we looked at um, from the perspective of the individual, but also in terms of, um, uh, yeah, mostly of the individual. But there's also other factors that matter as well in how much uh, people improve. And something that's maybe boring from, from a um, game perspective here too, but something that we maybe don't pay attention enough to, is some of the psychometric properties of the tasks too. So when you look at the uh, pre- and post-test measures, often in these uh, cognitive ability measures, uh, we run into issues that there are no very good um, measures that we can use over multiple times. So we use them in pre-test and post-test and follow-up measures. There often is just one measure. So what people do is maybe they split them in half or they split them in thirds. And what this does typically is also when you split the test in, in multiple parts, as you know, the less items you have, the less reliable they become as well. And also uh, other things that matter too, if you have tasks that are too easy from the get-go, if everyone scores the, the highest possible marks at the pretest, where are you going to go in your post-test? There's no way to improve here too. And of course that also predicts some of the, or is connected to reliability. And what I showed here is just some of the measures that we used, and what I've plotted here is the, um, uh, the uh, effect sizes in terms of how much the people improve as a function of the reliability is uh, estimate. So here, pre-post-test reliability, so retest the reliability. So not surprisingly, the more reliable your outcome measures, the more likely it is that you actually find transfer measures. Um, and then uh, last but not least for, for this set of um, uh, measures here as well. So the question is, who do we even get in our training study? So who is crazy enough to sign up for 20 sessions of this boring NBAC task? And um, why is it again that some people do improve and some people don't? What I'm, I'm showing you here is again the study where we compared um, uh, 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 different uh, people that either signed up for the training task here for un, uh, no payment at all, so they signed up. So we had some people who actually completed the entire training pre and post test, people who dropped out, uh, out after a couple of sessions, but they always have some people who you tell them everything about the design, they come in, we tell them again, you start testing, and then they say in the middle of the pre-test, you know what, I'm not really signing up for this, I don't want to do this anymore. And there's usually a sizable amount of participants who do that. And then we also recruit a participant for payment to just do some pre-test assessments. And what I'm showing you here is that very interestingly is that people who completed the entire training, so here is a composite of um, five different uh, matrix reasoning tasks, the people who started with the best scores to begin with are the ones who then actually finish the training. So I think these are probably not the ones that need the training the most, but the ones who needed the training the most either withdrew, dropped out, um, or uh, didn't even sign up for the training. The same, um, another interesting fact is too, so we give a participant a cognitive failure questionnaire, so we ask them how much you think that you forget things or you lose track of things. Typically everyone, um, of course, we are all forgetful, but interestingly enough that people who sign up for the training study at first, they report more of these cognitive failures. Whether or not that's objectively true is a different question, but from themselves they think they are uh, forgetful as compared to the people who just came for the uh, paid pretest. And then also when you look at um, a need for cognition questionnaire, so that asks of how, um, how much do you like to solve challenging problems, how much do you like thinking about things, so this is sort of a, a questionnaire for need for cognition. The people who signed up for the training uh, task and also finished it all the way through are the ones who have the highest need for cognition uh, scores here as well. 
So again, it seems to be that we are not always capturing the people who are in need of the training most um, to do this training and also stick with the training. So the real question is really what can we do to then also get some of these people who have issues um, here to stick with the training and then also come up with training designs which um, um, then also allows them to, to keep on task and, and keep track of the training. Um, all right, so these are some of the factors that seem to, to moderate some of our outcome measures. And when we look in our meta-analysis that I was showing you earlier, we also looked at some other potential moderators that might affect the training outcome. So one that um, surprised us the most, but if you give you the context here a little bit more, it might not be that surprising. But when I started to do this training work, I started to do that in Switzerland uh, as part of my um, uh, dissertation or graduate um, uh, education. And the way we ran subjects there, and here's uh, where this question comes from, uh, people sign up for these studies because they're interested in science. They want to help other graduate students, or they want to uh, just uh, participate because they're interested. So we never paid participants at all. And then I came uh, to Michigan as a postdoc, so I tried to continue these unpaid studies. Then, of course, no one signed up. So who wants to do four weeks of training for no payment at all? Um, <laughs> But there seems to be something that's very different in terms of who are your subjects in different countries. And I've run those um, studies in countries ranging from Taiwan to the Czech Republic to Switzerland to the US and now also in uh, Argentina and other parts. And, and again, there are definitely cultural differences in terms of how subjects uh, do your training. And of course, everyone who does cross-cultural stuff uh, knows some of these issues here as well. But what we did, we actually compared the outcome of studies which were done in the US versus studies that were done outside the US. We had a very crude um, uh, uh, division here as well. But we found very interestingly here is that we found more transfer effects in studies that were actually done outside of the US as compared to the US as well. And also when you looked at some of the dropout rates, we typically see larger dropout rates in the US as opposed to some other uh, countries here as well. So in Taiwan and Switzerland, we typically have like zero dropout. But here we get up to 50% of participants at one point in time, even if you pay them and say, ah, you know, I want to do something else and they leave. Um, so the reason why we see these differential transfer effects, it could, uh, it's probably not because let's say in the US they are just not as resilient or persistent, but it's also, it has to, it, it might have to do something with a more um, uh, motivation uh, level in a more general terms of how committed they think they are when they are taking part in these um, studies as well. Other differences that we see, which is related to this issue that I was mentioning before, so when we track the amount of payment that participants uh, get and then relate them to the amount of transfer that we see, we see something that's maybe a little bit counterintuitive, but the less people are getting paid, the more transfer that you see. Again, it might have to do something with intrinsic motivation. Uh, when we came to the US, again, we thought, oh, we solved this problem, we just throw money at the problem, people will come and do the training. But what happens is, uh, what I was mentioning before, people sitting there and just pushing buttons and do not really engage in training. Um, so that's one thing that we saw as well. And also another thing that's maybe um, a promising from an applied perspective too is participants with more room to improve, so we uh, start with lower ability levels, tend to be the ones that benefit more. Which is a bit of a problem because I was showing you earlier that the people who actually sign up for training and complete the training are not these guys here. So the question again, how can we get the ones who start with lower ability uh, levels to really stick it out and finish the training uh, in order to really uh, benefit? Other things that don't seem to matter, which uh, surprised some of them, uh, the people out in the field here as well. So for example, we didn't see differences between our studies and studies that were done in other labs as well because we've been accused, oh, it just works in your lab, no one else can replicate it. But when we compare the effect sizes, they are pretty much exactly the same here as well. We also don't see any differences between the types of NBAC uh, tasks that people are using, spatial or verbal or some other types of tasks. Also, when it comes to the types of uh, outcome measures, so the matrix reasoning or some other spatial reasoning matters, it, um, measures, it doesn't seem to matter that much. And then another thing, too, that has been very contentious, too, is the use of active versus passive controls. 
So active controls means that the control group would do something else, but not the experimental condition, uh, and passive controls would just be controls who come in for pretest and post-test, that would account for retest effect. And people have argued that you should really use an active control in order to account for potential expectancy effects that people should have. So if you're um, expected to be in a training study, that might affect of how well you do uh, in your post-test uh, assessment as well. And people have been throwing out the idea of the Hawthorne effect a lot. So if you're not um, using um, uh, active controls, what we're showing with our experimental uh, or with our NBAC training is are just simply Hawthorne effect. So people believe they do something and therefore uh, you should be get better at it. So let me show you an idealized um, a picture of how data should look like if we really just see Hawthorne effects here. So, um, so if we would compare studies with active controls, if we're just seeing a Hawthorne effect here, um, then we should see no difference between the um, treatment effect, so let's say the NBAC effects, and the control effects if there's nothing else but Hawthorne effects going on, right? Uh, but then we would see a difference here if we have studies with passive controls here, we would see this treatment effect, which is not real because it's a Hawthorne effect, and then the passive control um, uh, people should actually show um, uh, lower performance here. So the only difference uh, that people have been arguing that we see with cognitive training is because we're seeing this difference here. But let's look at the actual data. If you look at uh, across <coughs> these different studies uh, in the meta-analyses we're showing here. So this is actually the picture of the studies that use active controls and the studies that use passive controls. So it's very different from the idea of the Hawthorne effect here. So on the left, we see um, studies with active controls here. So we still see numerically a treatment effect, but it's, it's very, very low. And this treatment effect in studies that use active controls is actually the same size as the passive controls in studies that look, uh, use passive controls here which makes the story very, very complicated. So why is it that then studies that use passive control show so, um, so much better or higher effect sizes here? So there might be some other factors going on. What I was telling you earlier, which has maybe to do something with motivation, compliance, the way the, the outcome measures are assessed. So the very simple story of the Hawthorne effects doesn't really seem to fit the data. And I didn't bring the picture here or the graph here, but you can also read in the paper or look at it in the paper here. When you also plot, there are several studies that use uh, within the same study active controls, passive controls, and experimental groups too. And we when, when we then just directly compare active controls and passive controls, if there were a Hawthorne effect, again, you would see bigger effects in, this, uh, in the active uh, controls. But in fact, there's no difference between passive controls and active controls. The effect sizes are exactly the same. Um, so again, it doesn't seem to fit the um, story of the Hawthorne effect. And we're currently working on a new data set um, that goes beyond cognitive training to get at this as well. So the story, again, is not as black as white as uh, sometimes people uh, seem to make it um, uh, feel. So to sum up, um, this first uh, part here, and I'll go a little bit more in detail, we have some time here. So there's some evidence for generalizing effect um, to measures of fluid reasoning after targeted working memory training. And um, we, in my lab, but also in others, we have demonstrated some of these effects with multiple individual studies, but we, but also others, have shown uh, some of these effects uh, using meta-analytic uh, approaches as well. So there seems to be some generalizing effects in replication across different labs as well. But nonetheless, I really want to stress that there are certain moderators and again, individual differences that seem to determine training success. So I showed you a few of them could be individual differences from the get-go, so abilities, but also motivational factors that seem to drive some of these um, uh, differences. And then, of course, the quality of implementation is very critical with all uh, replication studies, by the way, not just in training. So the outcome measures, of course, have to be reliable. The training itself has to be reliable as well. Um, we have to um, emphasize that testing quality has to be adequate. So you cannot re um, expect the same effects if you test your participants in very noisy environments with, and you test 50 people at a time, which some people actually do, but of course, um, the, the noise level which will be much greater and of course the participants have to be engaged to really get some of these effects. 
So what can we do to improve some of these training outcomes? And we have been taking multiple routes, and I'm showing you um, I have three more uh, parts here of some of the things that we have been thinking about. So when we go back to the learning literature, so what are some of the factors that predict learning? And we know since the time of Bob Bjork and even earlier that task variability, so making it interesting to put it in late terms here, um, actually facilitates learning. And then the big uh, theme here too, and I was talking to Tim before as well, is the issue of gamification. So people who seem to have a hard time in engaging in the task, maybe it helps them if we gamify the task and make it more interesting. Maybe that helps learning as well, um, uh, through then improving engagement and motivation. Um, other factors that have been looked at extensively for hundreds of years almost is the issue of spaced or interleaved learning. So what is the training schedule or sh how should we organize the training schedule in order to maximize learning? Um, so for the first part here, so this is now work by Chong Chang, one of my um, visiting scholars. Um, she's now in Chai Chong uh, University uh, back in China. So here what we did, um, we modified our NBAC training to make, to really take into account task variability. Um, so what we did here, we went beyond just this plain, boring, um, spatial NBAC task, still boring NBAC task, but what we did, um, we actually varied uh, the stimuli um, that we, um, so we, we varied that, uh, participants got different stimulus material um, each session, so we changed that even within session a couple of times as well. And we, we also varied the difficulty of the stimulus material, ranging from, at the beginning, things like letters, and then objects like these, and then make it even more difficult, such as snowflakes or clouds, which are very hard to name. And then we also varied the amount of uh, interference resolution that people had to know, so we actually uh, embedded the same amount of lures as the amount of targets that people had to detect. So a very, very hard uh, variant of this task. And then we look at the outcome measures here. Um, so we had a composite of four different measures of fluid reasoning here. So we actually see very nice uh, effect sizes in uh, people who trained on this new variant of the NBAC task as compared to the active control here. And then also got better at inhibitory control here assessed with uh, two measures here as well. So something that we thought was very promising in order to really maximize some of the outcomes. Now, um, for Tim, so what about gamification? So one of these uh, questions that people throw around uh, here. So we have done now several studies, and I didn't bring all the slides, but I can tell you a little bit more here. So this is work by Ben Katz, one of my uh, graduate students I was working with, uh, with at Michigan. So we, we did, we had several variants of the NBAC task in which we had um, uh, uh, various ranges of motivational features and reinforcement schedules that we implemented here. And what I'm showing you here is the um, average training gain as a function of whether we included all motivational features that we had, or then we had a group that had no motivational features at all, just plain or we even call it the lame back, so just nothing <laughs> there, really, really very boring. So here's the amount of learning with um, all motivational features included here. And some of you laugh already here. So here's the group that had no motivational features all, just the plain and back. What we see here is actually way more learning in the old stripped down version of the NBAC task, the plain old uh, uh, NBAC task here. And this is maybe on a uh, first um, level you think, oh, this is very counterintuitive. But there's a lot of work also coming from developmental work as well. And, and the NBAC task, if you ever try that, is something that really demands your attention. So everything that distracts from your attention, it really makes learning and doing well in this task very, very hard. So when we uh, overdo it with the motivational features, then it actually doesn't really help you in improving learning. So what I have to say here, this is just a three-day um, uh, variant of this training here. So the question is if people train for 20 sessions or longer, whether the same thing holds here as well. But we just completed a, a study with, uh, in collaboration with UC Riverside here with Aaron Seitz, in which we compared this plain old lane back in young adults versus a very gamified version of an immersive 3D type and back game that we did. And we find pretty much the same thing here. So first of all, the kids or the adults, young adults, do find the immersive and back task more engaging and more interesting, but learning is actually better in the plain old laid back version as well. 
So it's a very delicate matter between making it engaging so you can stick out the training and then also um, get the people to really complete the task. And we haven't found the answer really to that, so we're running new studies to really figure out what are some of the motivational features that might be helpful. So showing them points maybe after the rounds or uh, things like that, but not during the task as well. And then the uh, last part here, what we were interested in, is looking some of the spacing effects as well. And here is um, uh, just new work, so this is work in progress with older adults. So I'm hoping we see a little bit here. So we had older adults um, do this uh, training with the different objects and shape as home on a tablet. And we had them train either every day, as was our usual uh, training schedule. We had them train twice a day, or we had them train every other day. And coming from the spacing literature, you would think that every other day, so the spaced condition should outperform the people who trained at least twice a day or who trained once a day. But what actually happened here, so I don't know whether you can see the color, but this, the top graph here, so the top <coughs> one here, is actually the group that trained once a day. And the one in the middle here is the group that trained twice a day. So the group here on the bottom here is actually the group that trained every other day. And this is in older adults, so we're running it with young adults here, but with older adults we were thinking, well, there also is some overnight forgetting, so we know that there are issues with consolidation, and if you have um, the people train every other day, they might take also some time to really um, uh, get into the task again. So what we're really interested in too, so these are just the training curves, and we're doing some longitudinal follow-ups. We just tested the first participant last week with a one-year follow-up. So the question is also whether this mass or space training plays a role in the transfer effects. And I cannot tell you the answer here. Maybe if you get me back a year, uh, in a year from now, I can tell you the answer to that here. But just within training itself, it doesn't really seem to help you spacing out, or let's say older adults spacing out the training, which is something that we were really not expecting to see. Um, so um, let me just skip to the end real quick because I see we're almost um, out of time here and you can ask me about some of the other studies too um, and summarize here. So in general, um, uh, targeted training, I hope I convince you um, that it might actually lead to generalizing effects in various populations. I showed you a glimpse of some of them uh, as well. But there are very important individual differences that predict a training outcome, and there's also features that have to do with the training itself that also seem to um, benefit or hurt uh, training outcomes. This is the part that I didn't show you here, but you can ask me later as well. Um, but generalizing effects can be long-lasting, at least with some of our uh, population. But uh, we have done some recent work with transcranial direct current stimulation where we actually see longitudinal effects up to 12 months after training completion, which we don't ever see with behavioral effects here. And with that, um, I really want to thank some of my uh, collaborators who have contributed to some of this work at the University of Michigan, but also in Europe, in, in China, and then some of my funding sources. And with that, I'm um, open for questions. Hmm.